Good morning. My name is Ben Song. I'm an online communications manager with the California Fiscal Partnership. Thank you for joining us today for one of four virtual briefings that we've organized ahead of tomorrow's Hydrogen Village at the Sacramento uh, State Capitol. The Hydrogen Village is the largest showcase of hydrogen and fuel cell technologies ever at the State Capitol. And it's an opportunity for us to educate policymakers in one of the world's largest economies and, in and a leader in zero emission mobility and environmental policies. The Hydrogen Village is a joint effort of the California Fiscal Partnership, California Hydrogen Coalition, California Hydrogen wow. Business Council, the Fuel Cell Hydrogen Energy Association, and the Stationary Fuel Cell Collaborative. I'd like to take a moment and thank our sponsor for the briefings, uh, the Gas Technology Institute and its Hydrogen Technology Center. With me today are representatives from the hydrogen and fissile industry who will share with us the opportunities and the challenges of hydrogen mobility and energy. Uh, during the briefings, everyone is muted. However, we will have a Q&A session at the end. So please use the questions feature to ask questions to the panelists. And with that, we have us, with us today, Katrina Fritz from the Stationary Fissile Collaborative who will be moderating today's session on power generation. Katrina. Thank you, Ben, and thanks for everyone for attending. It was great to see the participant list today, and we do encourage your questions. So I am joined by panelists Brady Borterding from Fuel Cell Energy, Darren Painter from Plug Power, Martin Herring from Bosch, Roy Segev from Ballard Power Systems, and Brady Van Engelen from Bloom Energy. We're really excited to kick off the Hydrogen Week in Sacramento. <laughs> Stationary fuel cell systems have been commercial for a very long time. They produce backup power at a small and large scale. They produce heat, power, and hydrogen at a large scale as well. They can run off of multiple fuels, natural gas, biogas, and hydrogen. So we really wanna focus our discussion on you know, how the fuel cell systems are evolving to meet these larger scale demands, how to meet resilience demands, um, air quality and emissions reductions objectives, as well as how do they fit into the hydrogen picture? Because the fuel cells did you know, come along in some respects first, and now we're talking about hydrogen in all of the states in the US and absolutely in California. So we want to give some context to where the fuel cells fit in. So I'm going to kick it off with introducing Darren Painter from Plug Power. Tell us about your company, what you manufacture, and where that belongs in this new hydrogen ecosystem. Thank you, Katrina, and thanks again to everybody for the time. Uh, as Katrina mentioned, I am Darren Painter from Plug. Uh, I am the VP of Sales for Stationary Power, and that uh, for us, that's commercial responsibilities for our zero emission stationary power systems. We produce stationary power systems that support applications anywhere from hundreds of watts to hundreds of megawatts in markets such as telecom, rail, utility, data center, in any type of critical facility backup. Um, as part of the bigger plug and how it fits in the ecosystem, um, Plug was the first company to bring a commercially viable market for hydrogen fuel cells, and that particular is, is material. Uh, but Plug has really moved application and are currently working in building a, a larger hydrogen oh, ecosystem yeah. with more than 100 different products. We have 50,000 fuel cells currently in operation. So as Katrina mentioned, this is new to a lot of people. It's not necessarily a new product in the industry. Um, we are focused again on bringing not only the fuel cell solutions, but the entire ecosystem, everything from the generation of the hydrogen molecule itself to the liquefaction, to the delivery of that molecule for its use in applications in what we're talking about here in station, stationary power, but also various other motive applications as well. So with that, um, I, I look forward to this discussion. Um, look forward to talking to, to everybody here about what we can do to show you how stationary power has been deployed and how it can be deployed in the future uh, to, to further the larger hydrogen goals. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Katrina. Thank you, Darren. Uh, next, Brady Borcherding from Fuel Cell Energy. Hi, thanks so much. Hi, my name is Brady Borcherding with Fuel Cell Energy. I'm the Director of Government Affairs for the West Coast. And I've been with Fuel Cell Energy for about two years. Uh, we're a company based in Connecticut and have been making uh, manufacturing fuel cells for about 50 years. Uh, traditionally, we're a power generation company with a uh, molten carbonate fuel cell. 
that makes uh, about 1.4 megawatts of power. Um, in the current sort of stage of our company, we're looking at hydrogen applications as why we're on this panel, but uh, one of the applications that we are very proud of is one that's going in at the Port of Long Beach, which is the, we call a tri-generation project, which will take two 1.4 megawatt fuel cells and produce about 1,200 kilograms of energy with about, uh, I'm getting a lot of feedback, but with about 2.3 uh, megawatts of green power. And so we see the sort of blending of fuel cell technology and non-combustion technology with hydrogen production as being a really key part of the sort of ongoing hydrogen conversation and the sort of future infrastructure for hydrogen as well. Um, we're also developing an electrolyzer uh, product, which will be hopefully well received in the market and across the United States uh, as a tool that can really smooth intermittency of renewables and also provide distributed hydrogen uh, as we look to build out the hydrogen economy across the country. I'm uh, looking forward to today's discussion and, and thanks to everybody for the organizing of the Hydrogen Village Day. Thank you, Brady. Martin Herring from Bosch. Hello, thank you, Katrina, and thank you to the other panelists. Um, yeah, Martin Herring, my name. I'm with Bosch North America and I'm a business development manager for our stationary fuel cell um, division. Um, Bosch is a leading global supplier of technologies and solutions. We have around 400,000 employees worldwide and are split into um, four major business divisions, mobility solutions, industrial technology, consumer goods, and energy and building technology, and therefore touch on a lot of um, fragments of the hydrogen ecosystem um, throughout our, our four big business divisions. Um, Bosch has mainly invested into um, hydrogen for mobility, as we are the largest car supplying company in the world. Um, we offer components and solutions um, for hydrogen powered vehicles and low emission vehicles. Um, on top of that, we have invested in um, modular stationary fuel cells um, on smaller scale systems, uh, currently piloting this technology in the European market using um, fuel flexibility um, as a key aspect using natural gas as well as hydrogen resource system. Again, in our energy and building technology division as one of the leading heating providers, um, especially in the European market, um, we have piloted hydrogen-ready um, heating technologies, hydrogen-ready boilers um, right now in the British market. And on top of that, um, also in our industrial technology division, we're working on components that are supporting um, the hydrogen distribution network and storage by offering hydraulics components um, for hydrogen compression. Um, pleasure to be here today with the other panelists and really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Martin. Brady Van Engelen from Bloom Energy. Thank you, Katrina. Uh, and I, I'm glad to be here as well. Well, uh, as you mentioned, my name is Brady Van Engelen. I'm on the policy and government affairs team here at Bloom Energy. Uh, quickly, a little bit about Bloom Energy. Uh, we're a California-based company, uh, a provider of both an electrolyzer for the production of clean hydrogen, as well as a solid oxide fuel cell technology. It's capable of producing always-on, reliable, resilient, and cost-effective on-site electricity. The solid oxide electro electrolyzer sorry, produces hydrogen with a very high efficiency, and uh, it's done so at a very competitive cost. And um, it, it can produce both on-site, um, and it can be distributed or large-scale for electrical energy generation or storage, as well as for high-temperature commercial and industrial applications, fuels or feedstock. Uh, by virtue of the Bloom Energy server's non-combustion process that converts natural gas, biogas, or renewable hydrogen into clean electricity, the Bloom Energy's technologies are capable of producing on-site or distributed power um, with uh, really, really high efficiencies, um, and it's capable of producing greenhouse gases, and it's done so with you know, virtually no air pollutants as well. Thanks, Katrina. Great. Thank you. Rice Segev from Ballard Power Systems. Okay, Roy's having some issues with his camera. Um, Roy, try to turn on your microphone, otherwise we're gonna move to the first question. I'm, I'm here, can you hear me? Yes. Good, uh, so uh, sorry for this uh, technology crush I have here, and the camera does not work for some reason. So first of all, I want to thank uh, Ben and Katrina for this opportunity to participate in this educational session. Uh, so my name is Roy Segev, I'm based uh, not too far away from Tel Aviv in Israel and I'm responsible for the megawatt scale stationary business of Ballard Power Systems. Ballard is, uh, most of you uh, all aware of, is one of the leaders in the PEM fuel cell technology for more than four decades by now, 42 years. 
As of today, uh, we have uh, shipped globally over gigawatt of fuel cell technology with substantial numbers of commercial deployments uh, and our heavy duty fuel cells are moving more than 1,200 trucks, uh, 2,500 buses uh, with accumulated drive of over 1 million kilometers. We also supply fuel cell for ships, ferries, rails, applications. And to date, we have deployed over 10 megawatt of stationary fuel cell systems. Uh, with respect to this session, I must say that we do see strong demand in pipeline for the megawatt scale stationary fuel cells, mainly coming from EU and North America. And quickly about the PEM technology, but not too many are aware of the fact that the PEM fuel cell is a very efficient machine with efficiency ranging from 50 to 60 percent, and it will be very uh, much applicable for the rest of this discussion today. A PEM fuel cell has also remarkable ramp up time, which exceeds any comparable diesel genset uh, that uh, is known. And in less than 10 seconds, we can ramp up from 100 percent to 10 second load. This quality, together with very compact footprint, makes a PEM fuel cell an ideal zero emission replacement for backup and picker applications for the stationary business. And with this, Katrina, back to you. Okay, thank you everyone for the introductions. So, a differentiator of fuel cell systems from other technologies like diesel generators is that they are non combustion, they don't combust the fuels they use, so they don't harm air quality. Uh, I want to ask another question about SB 100 in California, Senate Bill 100, which sets emission targets. Um, if you really read SB 100, you'll see it's not just carbon reduction targets. There's also air quality targets set in SB 100. So I'll direct the first question at Brady Vorterding to start with. Where do these non-combustion fuel cell systems fit into meeting California's SB 100 targets? Thanks, Katrina. I think your your point on air quality is really well taken here. I, you know, we face across California at least uh, annual, if not every other month, air quality crises resulting from things like wildfires or localized pollution. And I think as we're looking to transition to cleaner generation assets, uh, both for baseload and for you know for peaking power, we want to really be considering non-combustion technology because of that direct impact it has on uh, local air pollution and. So fuel cells, when they you know, process gas through a fuel cell to pick power, don't combust the, the fuel and as a result don't produce NOx, SOx, or, or particulate matter. And I think that stressing the reductions in air pollution in addition to air, um, air contaminants and, and also GHGs is really important as we look at finding firm always on power in California. Uh, so I think for us, we, we really see applications for fuel cells from fuel cell energy's perspective and I think you know, others on this panel will agree uh, in replacing assets like diesel that will run uh, frequently or in microgrids that could support critical facilities. Um, and I think you know, separately, we want to um, recognize that there are some policy situations in California that create a bit of perverse incentives for the use of combustion technology for precious resources that could go towards uh, clean power. For example, biogas in California is sort of one of the most precious resources for power generation. It's sort of like the saffron of California at the moment, but uh, we often find that, that biogas is going into CNG trucks where it's combusted in engines, which, you know, from our perspective is a really sort of inefficient policy outcome of that resource. And I think we would like to see the ability to use some of that biogas in state for either hydrogen production or, or power production in a way that that actually supports both SB 100's carbon reduction goals and also the, the pollution reduction goals. Thanks, Brady. Darren? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think uh, to kind of follow on with, with some of Brady's points, um, you know, we, and to follow on with, with Roy, what Roy mentioned with respect to PIM fuel cells. So PIM fuel cell technology, having the performance characteristics in a lot of cases better than what you see with the diesel gen set in response times, I think one of the, the first applications is direct generator replacement, especially when you see the PSPS events that are occurring in California and the need for backup generation throughout the state. And that's anywhere from, again, small telecom facilities to, to large substations in, in the tens of megawatts. And you can look at what you know, the various utilities are, are, are renting in, in the way of diesel gensets. And the ability to transfer all of that from a combustion engine to a zero emission technology, like a megawatt scale fuel cell, I 
think is very important. Um, but even above just, just direct generator replacement, there's opportunities, as Brady mentioned, in microgrids, adding resiliency to microgrids with zero emission, because if you have a microgrid consisting of solar and battery up to a certain point, a lot of times there's a combustion engine that sits behind that to add that resiliency. There's the ability to, to bring that, that overall footprint of some of these microgrids down to zero. Down, 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 the proper down, types of um, also, we're seeing a, a large amount of electrification throughout the state of California, uh, various fleets, various uh, ports, various other applications where there are grid constraints. And in, where there is grid constraints, whether it's from the, the capacity uh, to produce the power or whether it's the electrical distribution to provide that to the location it's needed, we, I think, as, a, as an industry, see fuel cells and non-combustion type solutions working hand in hand with electrification and the ability to provide a distributed energy source that can supplement that grid and do that in a zero emission fashion, we think is, is you know, very advantageous to the goals of, of SB100 in California as a whole. Thank you very much. Brady Van Engelen, please add. Oh, thanks. Uh, all right. Sorry. Oh, I said, please add to the discussion. I know you. Yeah. No, um, Brady and Darren have both raised some some really um, valuable points. That I think that are you know worth worth uh, echoing on my end. But um, you know, I also want to point out that you know SB one hundred is kind of a you know it, it's kind of the direction of the you know the net system. You know, the electrical. They're really contemplating the electrical grid, moving it to a uh, zero carbon future by twenty forty five. Is the, is, the, is the bigger goal. And every couple of years, the joint agencies publish a report that kind of looks at, you know, a, a status update, if you will. And the most recent one that was uh, published, I think, in February of this year, showed that on an annual, net annual basis, we're going to need up to six gigawatts of generation to meet the zero carbon future that we want to, you know, see in 2045. Now, that can only really be achieved if we figure out the right energy mix, though, because you know, right now, um, the pendulum is kind of swinging towards renewables, which are you know, solar and, and offshore wind, which are great, you know, they're, they're zero carbon and, you know, we're, we're certainly um, supportive of those efforts, but at the same time, there's an intermittency issue that that is going unaddressed when you uh, incorporate too many enter, uh, too many renewables into the, into the grid. And one of the things that was called out in very stark terms was the need to incorporate clean, firm generation. Uh, Brady touched on it, but I think it's worth echoing that you know, there needs to be more clean, firm power that's incorporated into the grid in the near future. Um, to that end, there was an article that was recently published, uh, you know, it's, I think it was titled Clean, Firm Power is the Key to California's Carbon-Free Energy Future. And the bottom line from that article was that electric demand, you know, we're, we're moving more towards a zero carbon future, which means we're going to need more generation through electricity, um, is going to increase. And it's going to increase quite substantially between now and 2045. And if we want to meet that demand, there needs to be clean, firm solutions that can kind of smooth out the demand that is going to be stemming from uh, greater generation. So, you know, uh, fuel cells, I think, is, is, you know, every panelist will tell you, you know, we have, you know, the, it, it's, it's really clean, firm power. You know, it's, it's basically fuel cells and geothermal. <laughs> uh, there aren't a lot of other resources that can provide the kind of constant, um, uh, constant generation that you can drive from a, from a fuel cell and do so in a, a non-combustible fashion. Um, so, you know, I, I think the report, you know, the, the report is worth looking at. And I also think that, um, you know, what they what they pointed to is worth heeding. The, the PUC very clearly caught that message in their midterm procurement uh, requirements, where they are actually, actually requiring the IOUs to go out and procure clean firm generation, not storage, clean firm generation. Um, so there is a difference there too, right? You know, we're we're not a battery. You know, we we do have long duration uh, capabilities, but you know, we're not storage per se. So, um, you know, I I think that's worth worth noting here is that we do fit that fuel cells do fit into that picture uh, with clean firm the clean firm generation component, and that you know that the energy mix needs to be, I guess, perhaps recalibrated to ensure that we're able to keep the lights on. So. While, while increasing the carbon reductions. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Martin Herring. I can just add to those points that the other panelists make, but I think really 
keeping your lights on is a, is a great way of describing it, especially if we look to, to smaller to medium scale deployments in, in dispatchable microgrids, where also fuel cells um, are a team player. They can play with solar, they can play with existing battery installations and firm up those installations that are already out there. Um, and ultimately then also enable um, the today's consumer to also become a prosumer in the future to really take a stake um, in what's happening in the energy ecosystem and support this transition. And I think this is true throughout all the technologies that the panel is describing here from the small scale, from maybe residential into small commercial, into the large industrial deployments. Um, so really fuel cells with the ability um, to not only provide reliable and clean power with ultra low emissions, um, but also offering this fuel flexibility. Today we can use natural gas readily, we can use biogas readily, but um, most of the companies on this panel have already shown the ability of their fuel cells to either run on pure hydrogen because it's PEM technology or the high temperature technologies that enable use hydrogen blends feasibly and then transition into pure hydrogen in the future. And this gives customers a direct pathway to decarbonize. Start today with technology um, ready to be plugged and play with the grid that is available. And once our gas infrastructure um, decarbonizes, uh, your asset decarbonizes with you without having to reinvest into new technology. And these are points that are really key for me um, to really help um, the state of California decarbonize with fuel cells in the mix. Thank you. Um, I'm going to direct the next question to Roy first. So Roy, Power Ballard stationary fuel cells is part of building out the hydrogen infrastructure to produce and deliver hydrogen. So let me thank you for the question. Uh, I would start and say I think I think it's worthwhile to reiterate, and it has been said before that, that at least from our side, since we are uh, we we are our technology is only PEM fuel cell. This is what we do. We, we make PEM fuel cells, and they are probably the only true zero emission power generators. So both on the mobility side, on the stationary side. And a PEM fuel cell utilizing uh, green hydrogen, uh, which we don't have yet, but it's going to come, will generate its electrical and thermal power uh, where the, the DI water as vapor is the only discharge from its exhaust. This, is, this, this has high impact on air quality. And we are in discussions uh, with several, I would say, entities within California explaining that this is a true zero emission machine. Okay. Um, um, but, but I think that I would like to add additional aspect to it, which is the cost. Because at the end of the day, when we start talking about zero emission and decarbonization and air quality, it all goes down to the bottom line, whether this is economical, when it's going to be economical. And, and so a little bit on the cost side. And although the current prices of fuel cells, because mainly because of scale, as we see today, uh, is, is, has, uh, in most cases, has doubled the cost of a similar diesel machine. With the current cost of diesel in California, and specifically the latest uh, uh, cost uh, of this, uh, uh, of, the, of, this uh, of, the, of the diesel uh, fuel in California, and with hydrogen cost and a moderate cost, which is going to be between uh, like three to four US dollars per kilogram of hydrogen, we are reaching a levelized cost of electricity, which is power with diesel. This is a very important message today. So even with a very high cost of the initial cost related to the fuel cells, we are power with, with diesel with the current elect, uh, cost of the, of the diesel. And I would even generalize it and say that in all instances where diesel gensets are used for continuous power or, or almost continuous power generation, and with the current diesel prices, PEM fuel cells are either par or even better than the cost of kilowatt hour, and certainly with zero emission, to zero emission. That's it. Thank you, Roy. Darren, how are plug powers fuel cell systems part of building out hydrogen infrastructure and producing and delivering hydrogen ultimately? I, I think it's a key part for us because what we've established is that stationary has been around. I think you'll, you'll all the panelists here, right? We've proven that stationary as a as a product is is a a system that can meet the needs of the application. And I think uh, Roy mentioned, you know, when the green hydrogen is there, that's a key part of what Plug is doing. 
Uh, PLUG is currently committed to putting in place, and these are already underway. We've announced a plant in Fresno County um, that will be producing, I think it's approximately 30 tons a day of hydrogen. As a company, we are putting in green hydrogen facilities to produce and distribute up to 500 tons a day by 2025 and up to 1,000 tons a day by 2028. We're doing that because we need the applications. It's, it's obviously the chicken and egg that's been there for a very long time, right? We see the trends. We know that the green hydrogen is going to be needed. And stationary is a part of that. It's a big part of that. Uh, it may not be the only part, right? There's motive applications. There's various other applications. But stationary is one of those applications. And as we continue to drive the applications, drive the opportunities, you know, that will continue to push the network of green hydrogen that's out there. They have to go hand in hand. Now, again, I, you know, we, we've committed to doing that. We're building that now. But again, the applications have to be there uh, to make that work, to make that economically feasible. So uh, it will happen, uh, but uh, stationary has been one that's proven that yes, we can deploy it. It does meet the application. And as we, as we grow this into, you know, the megawatt scale applications and truly start to replace combustion technology, that's only gonna grow. Thank you. Brady Van Engelen. Hey, could you, could you repeat the question again, Katrina? Oh, yeah. So I know that Bloom Energy, for example, uh, has now at least advertised that they're building an electrolyzer too. So you are making that transition to hydrogen-based fuel cell systems. So, you know, explain to us how your systems fit into building out the greater hydrogen infrastructure and producing and delivering hydrogen. Sure. Yeah, then it, I guess it starts at the, you know, you can start with the electrolyzer, the generation of green hydrogen, right? And I think as, as Martin kind of alluded to earlier in the panel, you know, part of the energy ecosystem requires, you know, partnering with other uh, energy resources. And, um, you know, here in California with the build out of renewables, we have a lot of curtailed energy that ends up uh, being otherwise not consumed and, and used for purposes of, um, you know, for, for really anything, you know, it's basically a stranded asset, if you will. But, you know, strategically placing, you know, an electrolyzer to consume some of that curtailed energy that would then be converted into green hydrogen and then pairing it with a fuel cell, stationary fuel cell, that's capable of consuming green hydrogen, um, could really smooth out some of that demand. So, you know, it, it, part of it fits into the bigger ecosystem. Um, the vision that, that's that been defined as part of SB100 and ensuring that we're able to to fit into that, uh, you know, and, and play strategically within that e ecosystem. Um, so that's kind of the, the bigger picture, if you will. But um, you know, that's that's kind of our 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 vision right now as as to where we're we think we're you know strategically where we'd fit into this bigger picture. Okay. So fuel cell energy has had tri generation systems operating for many years now, where they produce heat power and byproduct hydrogen that can be used to refuel cars, for example. So Brady, tell us about the evolution of fuel cell energy's technology as part of this hydrogen infrastructure and producing and delivering hydrogen. Yeah, thanks, Adrienne. I think a lot of us on this call would recognize that fuel cells have been sort of producing hydrogen internally for a long time, and we are now just getting to a point where the market is ready for that hydrogen to be its own, its own product. And for us, within our molten carbon fuel cell system, it's it's the hydrogen that moves across the electrolytes that and the anodes and the cathodes that creates the current. And so we're able to sort of devise technology that more or less in layman's terms puts a straw into the fuel cell and extracts that hydrogen for, for use as its own product. And, and that's what we've we've done with our tri-generation system is we've put two 1.4 megawatt um, fuel cells together, which would normally have a 2.8, obviously, uh, power output. Um, and we've dialed it down a little bit to be able to produce uh, excess hydrogen on site that we can put into tanks and we can use uh, either for fueling or for further applications. And so that's, that's the basis of our tri-generation platform. And that's what we're building um, in conjunction with Toyota and Michelle at the Port of Long Beach, um, which will hopefully be operational certainly next year and fueling uh, several of Toyota's class eight trucks and the, the Mirai vehicles that come off of uh, the container ships from Japan. And that'll work basically as uh, as there's demand for hydrogen, we can produce the hydrogen and put it in tanks. We can scale back the power generation, which will then go back onto the grid as, as under the biomat tariff. 
Uh, and this project will use directed biogas uh, to, to make green hydrogen and, and green power. Uh, and so we see this application, I think, is a really important, um, I've, I've referred to it sort of as an anchor, uh, an anchor asset, if you will, in the hydrogen infrastructure. And I think that's where we see a lot of our fuel cells going, and I think stationary fuel cells writ large, which is, you know, as Brady was saying, putting a fuel cell in an electrolyzer, I should say, solid oxide or PEM, out where the say solar wind generation is to be able to capture some of that intermittency, reduce transmission loss, and have and have the power sort of available and stored for dispatch back onto the grid is certainly one application. So sort of taking the hydrogen storage to the generation. I also think that where we are really eager to see some of our fuel cell systems is very close to its point of consumption or use. And so that's that's I think where our tri-generation system is at Long Beach. It will be just feet from the class eight trucks uh, station and then just a few, I think a uh, hundred yards from the passenger vehicle station. And we're, we're hoping that that system at Long Beach will be a point that, that we and other companies, honestly, and, and um, you know, consumers will use to point to, to build an infrastructure, say on the 710 corridor or between Long Beach and the Inland Empire, where we can demonstrate that there's a there's a way for us to decarbonize through hydrogen and heavy duty trucking or other applications a defined and notoriously pollution intensive corridor which could potentially be replicated in other places texas the northeast um, being two of them um, and so i think you know we we see the value in, in the fact that all of our fuels i think on this on this call have an incredibly high energy density relative to the space obviously that they occupy and so we have the, the sort of unique capacity to produce a lot of really valuable uh, hydrogen and energy potential very close to where it needs to be cutting down, I think, on a lot of that logistical um, tension that can happen with either transmission or pipelines. Sort of Long Beach sounds like a mini hydrogen hub, but we'll get into the hydrogen hubs a little later. Uh, Martin, where does Bosch fit into the greater hydrogen infrastructure? Yes, uh, I want to focus a little bit more again on the consumption side, maybe not so much on the production side since the other panelists have covered this already. Um, so we really see a lot of activities also in regards to how can we utilize our existing gas infrastructure um, and using this as a transitional piece. So hydrogen blending um, has been in discussion in various parts of the globe um, for a long time now, and we're seeing now um, the first real pilots are kicking off. Um, we, for example, we are testing our fleet of fuel cell systems in certain locations in Europe right now with up to 20% of hydrogen blend in natural gas. And really this enables a, a flexible end use, again, for any uh, asset owner of fuel cells, right? If you have the ability um, to get access to um, hydrogen infused natural gas to certain parts during the day, great, use it and reduce your carbon emissions even more. If it's not available, use the natural gas um, that you have available and um, use this as um, a low carbon um, source to produce your um, power and heat. So really by enabling this combination of um, the new infrastructure, the hydrogen infrastructure and um, the existing infrastructure, natural gas infrastructure, offers huge potential also in regards to existing storage capacities. Um, the grid alone um, has, has a huge storage capacity and uh, also allows a decoupling of the production of hydrogen and the consumption of hydrogen um, without um, dedicated hydrogen storage. Um, so we really believe that hydrogen blending will be a, a crucial part of enabling um, a widespread hydrogen adoption um, beyond um, the, the great and effective point use of hydrogen um, by itself. Thank you, Martin. I really appreciate everyone's responses so far, you know, for really showing where the power generation side of fuel cells fits into the further discussions we're going to have on the other panels later today. So one topic that Brady Van England touched on that I want to delve into a little bit is this fuel cells versus batteries debate. I'd like to talk about why we need both. Why, why is it important to have both fuel cell systems and batteries as part of California's energy portfolio? to also decarbonize sectors like electricity, goods movement, heavy industry, transportation, and for storage. Um, so Roy Segev, I would appreciate Ballard's perspective on this first. Thanks, Katrina. Um, so um, I would say the following, uh, both batteries and fuel cells has its role in the decarbonizing process, not only in California, we see it all over where batteries uh, will be probably used for, 
or short duration assets. And the fuel cells would, would cover the medium and longer the duration assets and storage. And, and maybe the best way to explain it uh, from, our pro, uh, from, from my point of view is to give uh, some, some examples, a couple of examples without uh, putting too much numbers. You know, we don't have a slice here, so I would like to do it. I will, I will try to do it by very simple two, two I would say, um, um, business cases. So uh, to begin with, I'll start with uh, everybody talks about data centers, and in, in, indeed, this would be the first uh, um, one of the first prime markets for fuel cells. So diesel replacement for data centers and similar critical infrastructures like bankings and so forth. Um, uh, j just to give an idea, a typical data center today requires an on-site storage of 24 to 48 hours of, of fuel on site. For a relatively small data center today of 30 megawatt, which is really considered as, as a small one today, the footprint uh, that would be needed uh, by using the state-of-the-art battery technologies today would be almost equivalent to the total footprint of the data center. And, and those are numbers that we have analyzed together with the big data centers and cloud computing companies. So uh, as a comparison, a fuel cell with a liquid uh, hydrogen storage on site would use 10x smaller footprint. Just on the footprint, using batteries for such applications would be almost prohibitive. So this is maybe one, one um, I would say, um, uh, example I wanted to share with you. The second one comes from maybe some, at later stage when we enter into the utility scale, renewable storage, batteries are really good for extending the day by several hours. So a PV plant may be extended by four, maybe up to eight hours using batteries. However, when re renewable assets need to extend its uh, generation on a weekly basis, or even more severe on a seasonal basis, there isn't probably a better solution than using molecules in order to store those kilowatt hours uh, by means of, of, of molecules and reuse them later on on a different season uh, by, by, by utilizing it through fuel cells. So there is a, a, a huge demand for both uh, batteries and the fuel cells. They're simply serving a different segment within the power generation. Thank you, Katrina. Thank you, Roy. Darren. Could you comment on why it's important to have both fuel cells and batteries to decarbonize California's broader energy portfolio? Absolutely, and I'll echo Roy's comments as well. Um, you know, we as a company, we see, especially in the stationary market, batteries absolutely have a fit in applications for what you consider short-term storage. What is short-term can be anywhere from minutes to you know a few hours, but once you push into any type of long-term energy storage, fuel cells, both economically, both footprint, you know, absolutely show that that is the, the much better solution. Um, now, we see that in, in direct applications that we utilize as well. So telecom applications, there's a small string of batteries to handle the, the short duration outages, right? The, the minutes, the 10 minutes switchovers. But when you need 24, 48, 72, hour, 72 hours, you are not willing to do that with batteries. Again, footprint and cost prohibitive. Um, we see that in the automotive and the material handling segments as well, right? Um, there is a battery function in all of those solutions, right? These are electrified vehicles. So there's a battery piece of this, but where the, the large scale energy storage comes from is the fuel cell and the hydrogen molecule specifically. So, you know, we don't see, it's very important for us, it's not batteries or fuel cells, it's batteries and fuel cells. They each have a fit and it's how you fit them together into the various applications is, is ultimately what determines which one makes the most sense. And in most cases, it's both, right? It's a combination of short-term batteries and long-term fuel cells. Thanks, Darren. Martin, what's your perspective on why we need both batteries and fuel cell systems? Yeah, again, uh, looking maybe more on, on a smaller scale and, and decentralized microgrids and behind the media applications, right? Um, fuel cells probably can't live without batteries in these circumstances. Um, to firm up loads um, behind the meter, um, to respond to 
um, fast load changes, and then um, potentially, as, as the other panelists have mentioned, the combination um, with solar uh, in this regard to really um, create um, like, like load following systems in a microgrid circumstance. This is one major application that, that we are seeing. Um, but on a higher level, as I agree with what the speakers have said, it's, it's fuel cell and batteries, or batteries and fuel cells, depending on the application. Uh, and definitely, long term storage is. Um, is one aspect that nobody around the globe hasn't solved yet for a completely electrified energy system. And um, just batteries is potentially not going to work. Uh, and therefore, an angle with hydrogen as another medium um, to provide um, not only another aspect of energy storage, but also provide another aspect of resiliency um, and also energy de in the dependencies um, and not just banking everything on one source, which would be all electrical, um, is the way. Um, my opinion that it's going to go forward, uh, and therefore, again, um, looking at the, the end consumer, um, and they can play a vital piece in this equation. Um, we see a lot of um, PV uh, and solar um, deployments combined with batteries today in the residential space and commercial space, and um, these are all opportunities where, where small to medium scale fuel cells can be added on um, to really firm up these loads behind the meter uh, and enable an even wider use of these technologies um, and a better implementation. Thank you, Martin. So I have one more question for the panelists and then we'll move to the audience Q&A, which is coming in. What do you think is important for policymakers in California to understand about the federal DOE hydrogen hub program? And I'll direct that question first to Brady Borcherding. Thanks, Regina. Um, you know, this is a yes, uh, yes. question. Uh, I think this is a this is a tough question in breadth. I think there's a lot that we still don't know. What we think policymakers should know about the hydrogen hub situation, given that there's still, for example, an undefined uh, term, which is the scope of a hub. What is a hub? How big is it? Um, you know, I think for California in particular, um, one thing that this state will have to prove is is why. And and I that's sort of a I mean to say that because it's clear that California has done investment in hydrogen. It's clear that California leads the country and, and many parts of the world in investing in hydrogen infrastructure, whether that's in vehicle fueling or in the capacity credits in the LCFS market, and really setting up a robust system on our own uh, for investing for hydrogen. And I, so I think that when we advertise that California has the academic resources, the, certainly the budgetary ability to match the funds, uh, the developer expertise in putting together an application, in my mind, that would make the federal government ask the question, so why do we need to give you money? And I think that that's going to be a big hurdle for California. It'll be a big hurdle for a place like Texas. Uh, and so I think having a really compelling application, as opposed to, you know, I'm not accusing anybody of doing this, but I think, you know, the California exceptionalism argument may not be as successful in this context as as maybe we would like to think. And so I think as we look at how to put together a successful application across you know, the state, it begs the question, you know, is the entire state the right scope for an application? Is it a specified corridor? Do we take the approach of, for example, like the, the TCC program that California has, where we, we decide that you know, we put a lot of money into transforming a particular community and, and we use the scale of that investment to really have transformative change. Is that what our application is about in California or are we trying to spread the money across if we were able to get the application awarded to us, spread the money across the entire state. Uh, and so I think, you know, maybe we double down on places where we've already made investments in heavy duty trucking infrastructure uh, and also to demonstrate long term energy uh, storage. But, you know, I think th the main message that I would have is um, we need to be extremely compelling in our application because we have so many things already in place that make us competitive for a lot of these grants. Thank you. Do others have something to add to Brady's response? Sure. Uh, always do, Katrina. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, you know, to echo some of Brady's points, I think California's obviously, with with all the investments made to date, is is very well positioned. Um, you know, through our work with various groups, you know, not only in California as it relates to hub. We feel that the DOE is really looking for commercialization and readiness on these projects, and they're looking for an ecosystem. And to Brady's point, ecosystem doesn't mean geographically it needs to cover a certain amount of area. 
it means it just needs to be a true ecosystem that, that encompasses multiple aspects of a, of a hydrogen, quote, hub. It's not just one single application. It needs to be truly, you know, across applications, across the entire supply chain of hydrogen. Um, we're seeing that. Um, we're seeing activity in other regions like the Northeast that have uh, put together collaboration agreements, multi-state, multi-agency agreements to get these in place. Um, we'd hate to see California not be the leader in this. They've been the leader in hydrogen from the beginning. Um, and, you know, again, well positioned, but I think that the activity needs to take place. We're seeing it in other regions and, and, and we believe California needs to, needs to participate and, and, and show, you know, maintain that leadership role, again, both, both nationally and internationally. Thank you. So in the interest of time, I'm going to move to the audience Q&A. And the first question we received early on is one I'm going to direct first to Brady Van Engelen. Uh, just a question about the status of the CPUC proceeding to come up with a rate structure for microgrids. Is hydrogen-based fuel cells, are hydrogen-based fuel cells eligible for any incentives under this rate structure? um technically yes <laughs> if you're talking green hydrogen so you know it, it, that's considered renewable uh, under rps so um and it, it technically would be nim eligible which is effectively what uh the microgrid track two decision uh, provided for was uh nim elig or eligibility to the eligibility to the microgrid tariff for nim eligible resources and technically uh green hydrogen is considered and falls under that umbrella. So so with green hydrogen, yes, it would be uh, considered eligible for the microgrid tariff. Thanks, Brady. So the next question is from a member of the fire department. So thank you for attending, Jonathan. He was wondering if there are recommendations for resources for training and permitting on sta using stationary fuel cell systems like the NFPA or California Fire Code. Who would like to take that one first? Because I know there are. Darren, I know, you know, you've installed thousands and thousands oh, yeah. of backup yeah. power yeah. systems and they all have to be certified and be permitted. Uh, and, and, you know, the overriding code is NFPA2. Um, so obviously the education around NFPA2, uh, it's really around the hydrogen storage uh, itself. Uh, you know, the fuel cells and depending on how they're deployed, how they're certified are probably not near as much of a factor um, because they're consuming the fuel. It's the fuel storage um, that is, is driving a lot of the codes. Um, we have effectively deployed almost, I think, somewhere around 175 large scale liquid hydrogen storage solutions around the country, including systems in both northern and southern California. And we have several hundred smaller scale gaseous hydrogen storage have worked effectively to have those permitted and deployed with all the various agencies throughout California. Um, again, I think you'll find across the panel here, we can help support that um, as it's deployed in a given region, as the knowledge is built up, it gets obviously the, the second one's much easier than the first one, uh, but uh, it's typically just an education process. Uh, NFPA is the overriding code in most cases uh, as you work through that process. So if he wanted more information, he could reach out directly to the fuel cell companies. Yes, we would absolutely, you know, any, any information we could provide to help support any questions related to that. Um, and again, I think just having a, a strong working knowledge of an FBA too would be valuable. Thank you. Okay, the next question. It seems that green hydrogen is most incentivized for use in the mobility space due to the low carbon fuel standard and the potential of ERINs. What needs to be done to incentivize green hydrogen for stationary applications? What are you seeing as the price spread between green hydrogen and mobility versus stationary uses in California? Is there a volunteer or do I need to call on someone? I'll, I'll start and then I, I'm gonna pass it off to someone else if another panelist wants to, to pick up the the baton from there, but I, you know, just one thing to point to on the, on the stationary side, um, you know, in addition to the hydrogen hub that, you know, the DOE's also got something called the hydrogen shot, um, which I think is, is designed to mirror 
the sunshot, which was what, 10, 15 years ago, brought the price of utility scale solar from 15 cents per kilowatt hour down to three cents per kilowatt hour, you know, what we're seeing right now. So, um, you know, consumers enjoyed a, a, a very, very stark benefit from where it started to where it finished. Um, so we do, you know, we have the, uh, the DOE very interested in, in actually scaling uh, hydrogen which is going to, to drive down costs. And I, I think that's probably going to be one of the, the biggest factors, but I'm sure there's others. And you know, if, the, if the other panelists want to chime in, then, you know, I'd certainly welcome it. Yeah, I think it's also important to understand that uh, um, I would say the competitive level of fuel prices um, that you're competing with in the transportation segment compared to the power segment is way higher. Therefore, the pathway of uh, clean and green hydrogen into the transportation segment from just the economic perspective um, is lower because the competing price for fuel is is higher. Um, with that being said, um, can just echo what Bray said, with prices of um, clean and green hydrogen coming down in the near future, we're coming closer to a, to a parity cost also um, on the stationary side. Um, plus, on top of that, um, with larger scales in production, um, cost of technology, capex costs are coming down, which will overall enable um, the stationary ecosystem to also be a strong adopter of um, clean hydrogen. Uh, on top of that, I think um, that uh, with more and more of market um, mechanisms being made available also for small scale deployments in regards to um, maybe being able to um, to bank on um, the resiliency factor of fuels in the future and uh, monetize these aspects uh, will also help those technologies um, to to overcome, I would say, the challenge right now they have with, with high fuel prices in regards to clean and green hydrogen. I may, I may add here some, some, something from my side. As opposed to the mobility business, the stationary business has two extreme ends to each solution. On one end, there is the standby backup. And in this case, the cost of the hydrogen has less impact on the TCO, on the total cost of ownership. And in this case, the incentive should be not on the hydrogen side, but rather on the, on the capital equipment side. Where on the other side of it, when you start running those fuel cells for continuous power, I think that the, the, what we've learned that the level of cost of the hydrogen for mobility and for those applications are almost the same. So it would be uh, it would be applicable same same incentives that are applicable for the mobility for for continuous power generation it's going to be almost the same. Okay, thank you. Another question from the audience: What is the future of large scale storage of hydrogen for city scale electric power? And I know Doosan isn't on the panel today, but I can you know, cite that Doosan has a 50 megawatt uh, hydrogen plant today in Korea. And Korea has been doing a lot of these city scale fuel cell systems. But what are the plans you know, and what's the future of the large scale storage in combination with your plans for those large scale projects? I'd be happy to, to talk to it a little bit. It, it, it kind of goes to, to Roy's point as well, right? Are we talking continuous power? Are we talking large scale storage for backup type applications and resiliency type applications? Um, obviously, you know, the, as, as green hydrogen is produced in bulk, uh, storage is provided in bulk. You know, there's traditional methods out there right now with, with large scale liquid hydrogen storage that exist and can be, can be expanded on. Um, a couple other, you know, technologies that are, are going to be brought to, um, I think, to commercialization here relatively shortly is obviously leveraging um, geologic applications, whether they be uh, uh, abandoned salt mines, things along those lines. We're seeing those applications already starting to be deployed with hydrogen where you can store large scale hydrogen gas. And I think, uh, you know, as stationary power becomes more predominant, as the production of green hydrogen becomes more ubiquitous, you're going to start to see, I believe, true pipeline deployment. Uh, that pipeline can be obviously dedicated hydrogen. Uh, in Martin's case, obviously blends in some of the initial uh, aspects. 
also some of the existing pipelines that are no longer being used could ultimately be storage as well. So there are a lot of means and ways to do that. Some of them relying on traditional, some of them relying on non-traditional ways to do that. But that is absolutely part of overall strategies within stationary businesses. How do we move into multi-megawatt scales and resiliency, you know, framework, you know, weeks and, 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 and months, seasonal type storage. Uh, it's absolutely part of the, the overall, uh, I think, strategy of, of companies across the board here. Thank you. So there's a question about Northern California that I know a lot of you have systems in Northern California. So I'm going to call on you. There's some concern that we're only hearing about fuel cells in Southern California. Um, so maybe answer this in the context of where you have fuel cells today in Northern and Central Valley, California, as well as how you think the hydrogen hub might impact that. Brady? Van uh, sure. Sorry, Brady Borcherding. Well, Brady Van England, if you're ready, go for it. Yeah, go ahead, Brady B. Well, well, I guess, are you asking sort of how do you think, is the question about how our existing fuel cell assets are going to play into the hydrogen hub conversation in Northern California? No, I think how can we increase the investment into, you know, of, into stationary power of fuel cells in Northern California? But I think also just touching on what's already there would be helpful to the audience. Sure. You know, I think um, one of the things we look at biogas, for example, as a, as a feedstock that could be used for hydrogen production in Northern California. We've got a lot of urban centers in Northern California. There's going to be a steady um, supply of organics into either landfills or diversion or certainly wastewater treatment plants. Um, you know, Northern California could could specialize as its own sort of hub, you know, with or without the federal investment, there's a certainly a strong corridor from the Bay Area to Sacramento to even the Tahoe region and over to Reno that could be sort of an anchor line, if you will, um, for hydrogen assets. There's a lot of potential there, I think, for the use of solar for wind, um, where there's a you know, sort of existing generation assets, but that there's lots of there's lots of demand there. There's there's uh, municipal bus applications, there's um, wastewater treatment plant or actually, um, garbage truck applications, school bus applications. So I think, you know, uh, we talk about Southern California a lot because that's where sort of our project is at the moment. And there's, I think, a, a strong heavy duty trucking corridor uh, through Southern California, but there, that isn't necessarily untrue of Northern California with I-5. I think it's just more dependent on other states uh, being a part of this, like Washington or Oregon as we go north or, or Nevada going, going east. Thank you. So we only have a minute left. Um, I really appreciate all of the audience questions and I will be turning this back over to, begin, to Ben, but before I do, I wanna thank all of the panelists. It's always a pleasure working with you. It's always a pleasure learning from all of you. So thank you very much for participating today and sharing all of your experience and knowledge. Um, and thank you to the California Fuel Cell Partnership and the California Hydrogen Coalition for inviting us to kick off California Hydrogen Week. Thank you, Katrina. And again, thank you to all the panelists and, and especially to Katrina for, for moderating today. Um, we have three other sessions today that I want you to make, make me aware of. We have a heavy duty transportation session coming up in about a half hour. Our light duty transportation will come up at 1.30 and then uh, we'll end with our hydrogen production panel. And so um, please do uh, register for those as well. Um, each one has their own unique link. And so uh, you'll, have to rest of, uh, you'll have to register for each panel session. Also, this webinar will be recorded and will be posted on our uh, YouTube channel. And so once it's ready, we will send out an email uh, to where that, uh, that link is, where that location is. And so with that, thank you again. And if you have any questions that we weren't able to answer, please feel free to shoot that over to us and we'll get that over to our panelists. Again, thank you for joining us and hope to see you uh, later this um, at the next uh, panel session. Thank you all.